Hello, I'm Keith Halliday. Welcome to Our Yukon Commissioners, an interview series with those Yukoners who have filled the evolving but always crucial role of Commissioner of the Yukon Territory since the 1960s. Today, we're lucky enough to have with us Ms. Geraldine Van Bibber, who was Commissioner from 2005 to 2010. Ms. Van Bibber, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you have a very interesting bio. I had the privilege to read it before the show as I did my research. And born and raised in Dawson City, a business person in the tourism industry played a key role in the foundation of the Yukon First Nations Tourism Association, and then really quite a very wide range of uh, roles in Yukon, First Nations, and national organizations, the Yukon Human Rights Commission, uh, the Gathering of Traditions Potlatch Society, and most recently the Yukoners Care Cancer, Cancer Foundation. Uh, and then of course the Commissioner itself, uh, a very big role. Um, why don't we take, it back, take us back in time to 2005 and just tell us, you know, for the younger viewers, what was on the agenda in the Yukon? What was on people's minds um, around the city and in the Yukon more broadly at the time? I think 2005, uh, which is now 10 years ago, and as I get older, I realize 10 years isn't a, a big time in uh, my life, but the politics were similar to what we have today. It was an interesting time because I was chosen as commissioner of the day and uh, was very thrilled when they offered uh, and asked me if I would take on the role because being a Yukon kid from Dawson City gave me a wonderful view of the Yukon from a different angle. Yeah, so what was your reaction when you first got the phone call from, from Ottawa, I suppose? Surprise. Surprise. Uh, they uh, had uh, given me the phone call and I uh, asked if I was interesting, interested in letting my name stand and of course I was. Uh, when I was a kid, as I said, no Yukoner ever thought they'd be commissioner. So to be a, a local born Dawsonite to become a commissioner is, is a real coup. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a very special event. And uh, so tell us a little bit, you know, the role of the commissioner has evolved over the years. Uh, how would you describe it in 2005 when you took over the role? It has evolved from the commissioner basically running the government of Yukon to being a ceremonial role similar to a lieutenant governor of a province. And, uh, but despite that, there's a lot of admin work that is essential to the position, such as the send to the bills, uh, order in councils. All the work that the government does passes over the commissioner's desk, as well as all land transactions in the territory municipal, federal, and territorial. So the commissioner's in the know about a lot of what happens uh, on the daily business of, of Yukon. A lot of things to sign, no, no carpal tunnel syndrome, I hope. A lot of things to sign. <laughs> and then, of course, the ceremonial part is being at events where people are celebrating special things in their association or uh, special events in Yukoners' lives, and I was just wonderful to be a part of that. Now you were very active in the community. You were a very visible uh, commissioner. Uh, I would dread to see your schedule about how many events you went to in a given week. Uh, but, but that is a, a critical part of the role. And, and how do you think Yukoners think about the role of commissioner and how they value you know, when you were in office seeing you at the events? I think they really liked it when I appeared. Um, some people have a, a not so good vision of us needing a commissioner, uh, but I firmly believe in ceremony and protocol, and we do need that next level uh, above the government. And even though uh, we don't have a lot of power, uh, it is there in writing, we could use it, however, we'd never choose to because of the implications of, uh, of using your power as commissioner or the head representative of the federal government really is what the commissioner is. Now it's interesting you said it was important for us to have that extra layer above the pol political government of the day. Why do you think that is so important? Again, it goes back to being, uh, being part of the Commonwealth and being part of, even though we are Canada as we know it today, a lot of the younger generation would not know 
standing up and sing, singing God Save the Queen and O Canada every morning before school. But we grew up in an era of, of protocol and ceremony and it still continues in most of our parliamentary system today. So I don't think you, Connor, should shun it. Yeah, it's something that ties us all together with our it does. Yeah, other parts of Canada and the Commonwealth. And when I was commissioner, I thought part of my role was trying to explain the importance of what a commissioner is and what they do. Let's talk about your time in office. Uh, a lot of things happened from 2005 to 2010. What were the, you know, the two or three you know, big issues that were on the agenda of the commissioner's office or of the Yukon more broadly at the time that you worked on? One of the biggest issues was uh, the election in 2006, I believe. And the polls were stating that it was going to be a three-way run. And I quickly became concerned because, again, the commissioner at that point, if there had been a three-way tie, the commissioner would have to step in and declare who should run the government. Unbeknownst to most people, it was a nail-biting evening for me. However, the polls were wrong and the Yukon party uh, became the official government. Yeah, now that uh, ultimately in terms of constitutional power is one of the most important roles of the commissioner. So who did you rely on as you thought about that potentially extremely important choice? You know, you must have had senior officials in the Yukon government. Did you reach out to, to friends and resources in other parts of Canada or the Commonwealth? Or, or how did yes. you think through those, those, uh, those choices you might have had to make? All of the above. I uh, went to the clerk of the assembly of our local legislative assembly. I also contacted Rito Hall and also contacted Frank Fingland, who is an ex-commissioner as well, who is very versed in the role that a commissioner would play should an event like this happen. So it, like I say, it was a nail-biting nail evening for me and a very good learning curve as well to, to find out what the actual responsibility I had. Yeah, the federal government just extended the governor general's term uh, to make sure he had plenty of time past the upcoming federal election because who knows, the same thing might happen there. Exactly. Uh, but you, you dodged that, uh, yes. that big crisis decision. Uh, yes. What else was on your agenda during your time in office? Oh, it was jam-packed full of interesting events to attend, to, to get involved with, um, as the role of commissioner really is not controversial. Uh, there were people who wanted to speak to me about various happenings in a government department or a personality that they were having trouble with, thinking that I had, again, the power to fire people, do all those interesting cleanup acts. However, I told them I was there to listen and I could pass on a message, but I would not interfere. And I think each commissioner has run into that over the years. Mm -hmm. So how would that work exactly? Someone would come in with a particular mm -hmm. issue they had with the government and, and you would you know, listen to them and then you know, describe how you would explain the situation to them and then how you, like, what possibilities did you have to bring it to the attention of the government of the day? How did that work? Generally, I would steer them in a direction of the correct department, but also give them advice that you know, this is what I thought could or could not solve the problem. and, and uh, I generally thought people left with feeling like they had accomplished something by coming to my office. And uh, um, what else did you work on during your time in office? I created the commissioner's pin. I uh, was very involved again in trying to educate people about the role of the commissioner. I felt it was too often lacking in uh, protocol. and. So I found when I went to an event, sometimes people just didn't know what to do with me. I was sort of a, oh my gosh, the commissioner's here, and uh, stand over there until we're ready for you. So my staff and I set out a set of instructions on what to do when the commissioner arrived at an event. And it seemed to put them at ease, and it made my life easier. So all sorts of things, little small things, big things, it was... Uh, there's no instructions when you go into the office, other than the admin part of what to sign and uh, what to do when you enter the, the legislative assembly. So you have to put your own stamp on it. 
your own feel, your own um, import, what your likes and dislikes are into your role. You've mentioned uh, the importance of educating people about the role of the commissioner a couple of times. Mm -hmm. What do you think, uh, do you think we need to do more, for example, in the school system so yes. that uh, the next generation understands the federal government, the Yukon yes. government, First Nations, the commissioner? What would, uh, what would you suggest there? I think it should be a part of our government system. When we learn in school, we generally learn about the Ottawa Parliament, bring it down to the Legislative Assembly, and understand why we have party politics and not the other two territories. There's a whole raft of things that could be incorporated. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned uh, each commissioner doing things a little bit differently. There's no owner's manual for the role. No. What do you think you did differently from some of your predecessors? Well, I think being part First Nation and part non-First Nation, I will walk comfortably in both worlds. And I hoped I was able to marry the two with many of my events. Uh, I tried to make sure it was inclusive. My ball guest list every year was varied and wide and tried to think of ordinary Yukoners who would think I'd never be able to go to the commissioner's ball. And, and how, did that, how did that work oh, out? How was the reaction? It was fun. It was fun to see people's expressions, to, to see uh, uh, me put them at ease and, and include them in everything I was doing. And that's really what I think the role should be. Now, the Yukon government is still working out its own relationship with uh, First Nations, even many years after self-government's been in place. And, and uh, several First Nations had completed their agreements only a few years before you took office. Uh, so how did the relations of the Commissioner's Office and the various First Nations, how did that develop during your time in office? Well, again, I'm, I was apolitical. So staying away from the politics side, I would not answer any of the questions that related to that. Uh, did get blindsided a few times with questions from the media, but I could sidestep those easily. The First Nations uh, were very receptive of me just because of who I am, born Yukon girl again, and well-known Van Bibber family, so people were very receptive. So uh, looking back now, uh, it's been five years since you left office. What do you think you learned while you were Commissioner of the Yukon? Because uh, uh, you participated in a lot of events, inspired a lot of people, taught a lot of people about being commissioner, but you must have learned a few things yourself. Oh, I certainly did. You always, you never stop learning. And uh, the, uh, the message I tried to get is always enjoy whatever you're doing at the time and because and, uh, you always keep learning as you go. But I thought um, the way people responded to me was interesting. It was, uh, you learn a lot about human nature, <laughs> good and bad. Now, in many ways, becoming commissioner is the capstone of a long career in public life for you. Yes. At the beginning of the interview, I listed why I couldn't even get through the entire list of all the many interesting and important community groups you've been involved in over the years. But life doesn't stop when you leave office. What have you been doing since you were commissioner? Well, I tried to stop. I took semi-retirement for four years, and in that time, I am now Chancellor of Yukon College. I am still very active in the Yukoners Cancer Care Fund fundraising. And I also just took a part-time job with the Cabinet Office and am community advisor to the Premier. So it's all interesting, all... Um, so I still have something to give back to the Yukon, and I'm not quite sure what it is yet, so I'm still searching. So when I grow up, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to be. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming in, Ms. Van Bibber. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Today, I'm delighted to have with us the current commissioner, the Honorable Doug Phillips. Thank you for coming, Commissioner. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Uh, so, you know, the commissioner is really the capstone of really quite a remarkable career you've had here in the Yukon. Uh, an F.H. Collins grad, like myself, I might add, active as a small business owner for many years, uh, 15 years in the legislature as, a, as an MLA, including a number of high-profile ministries such as tourism and education and justice. 
and then really a very wide-ranging uh, set of activities in government and non-government organizations that are too numerous to list, but a, a few are chair of the Yukon Land Use Planning Council, um, and you were one of the founding directors of the Hospital Foundation, uh, and all of that before you were appointed commissioner in 2010. It's quite yeah, I thought I was here. retired. It never worked <laughs> out that way. And now they've extended your commissionership again. Yes, they did, uh, which is uh, very interesting because of the new developments of the commissioner with uh, respect to moving into our new office. So, Yeah, no, exactly. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, you know, in some of the earlier interviews we had in this series, we talked to commissioners from the 60s and 70s. Uh, would you tell us what's your role, what's your view of the, the role of the commissioner today? Well, today's commissioner is more uh, similar, uh, fundamentally similar to a, a constitutional uh, monarchy. Uh, we do the things like read the speech from the throne, uh, sign the bills into law and that kind of thing in the territory. The other part of the job is really a ceremonial part of the job. And that's uh, things like the uh, Canada Day celebrations, Remembrance Day celebrations, and uh, my awards program when you recognize various uh, Yukoners around the territory for their outstanding contribution to Yukon and that's that's really the fun side of the job because you get to do all kinds of cool things like that. The other side of it I guess is uh, that I get to do is I get to make Yukoners aware of how important things are to us in Canada like I just toured the Yukon schools and did uh, about our Canadian flag, the anniversary of our Canadian flag. I did the Diamond Jubilee tour celebrating the Queen's anniversary uh, a couple of years ago. In 2017, it's going to be a big year in the Yukon. We've got the 150th anniversary of the founding of our country, and we also got the 75th anniversary of the Alaska Highway. So it's those kind of things that you you work on and help Yukoners understand the significance of them to, to Yukon and to Canada. Now, given that you were in the legislature for 15-odd years, you really had the opportunity to see the see Yukon politics evolve, but also see the, the commissioner's office evolve. and. Uh, compared to when you were first elected or in those those earlier days in your career, how has the office changed? Well, actually, it's changed dramatically. Uh, you know, Jimmy Smith's there, and even uh, you know, prior up to Ione Christensen, uh, the commissioner was the be-all, end-all. The commissioner was virtually the premier, and in fact, he was even probably more powerful than the premier because he just took advice from the elected members and really didn't have to follow the advice. In fact, prior, I think, to Ione, the commissioners were mostly from Ottawa or somewhere else. They were appointed to come here and tell us how to run the territory. And uh, the biggest change was 1979 with the Up letter. And that changed everything. That uh, sort of transformed the commissioner into being from the chief executive officer to being uh, virtually the head of state or the individual who acted like a lieutenant governor. In fact, uh, a book that was presented by the, or, or produced by the Cretchen government at the time gave us direction as commissioners to uh, actually act like we are lieutenant governors. And in fact, that's kind of the constitutional monarchy role that we play today. And that's, uh, that's, that was the biggest change in the role of the commissioner. Now, you were a minister uh, in years when it had not been that long since the EP letter. Uh, how, did, how long did it take the federal government, the Yukon government, the officials uh, to get used to the new system? What were the, what were the birthing pains of that? Well, I think, you know, I, I mean, I, I was pretty young in politics then, and I, and I kind of didn't really understand my job, even as an MLA, and you're kind of right off the street like a lot of new MLAs are. But what I did discover is that it really, uh, uh, it kind of came rather rapidly, I think, because, in fact, uh, from Jimmy Smith on, uh, they were lobbying for more control by the elected people in the territory as opposed to Ottawa controlling it. So I think they were ready to, to grab the reins and drive the cart, but they weren't quite sure how to do it. So there was some growing pains in how that uh, took place and who was taking orders from whom. And there was some cute confusion, I think, from time to time, because I, I, I remember then that there was a very strong federal government presence still up on the hill, with all the departments and uh, because it was prior to devolution. Devolution hadn't taken place yet. So we had some responsibility, but we kind of had uh, two masters we had to deal with. We had the, our own bureaucracy in the territorial government and then you sometimes when you were dealing with land or other resources you had to deal with the federal people up the hill and they were, I think federal people were a little bit reluctant to give up the reins so quickly. So there was some times when they struggled to get some things done over those years. Now, when you took office in, as commissioner in 2010, uh, the system had stabilized a little bit. 
Uh, tell us about some of the big things that you've worked on since you were commissioner. What's, uh, what, what, what has been keeping you busy these last few years? Well, th I think that one of the first things I got into when I became commissioner is uh, I talked to, uh, I, I met with Geraldine Van Biver, the, the former commissioner, and, and said, what are your big issues? And she said, you know, one of our issues is the name, commissioner. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, unfortunately, there's commissioners of everything now. There's a police commissioner, there's a human rights commissioner, truth and conciliation commissioners. There's commissioners. Every time we have a problem in Canada, we create a commission with commissioners. And so when you talk to somebody in, in Ottawa or even somebody in the Yukon and say, I'm the commissioner of the Yukon, and they say, what are you commissioner of? And I say, the Yukon. They say, no, 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 what are you commissioner of? So it sort of diminished, the, the, the title we have has diminished the role that we, we really have in the, in, the, uh, in the structure of democratic government in the Yukon. So that's, that was the big problem then. I know uh, Geraldine and her counterparts in Northwest Territories and Nunavut were working to change that. I tried to work and change it and uh, haven't been successful. Uh, they weren't successful. I, I think it will come. It's like uh, years ago with the EP letter when we were called government leader. You know, That's the, right. I mean, you could, the, the government leader would step off the elevator in a meeting in Ottawa and the press would run over them trying to get to uh, Premier. And, uh, you know, because government leader didn't mean anything to him. Uh, similarly, I think that kind of change will slowly come to the territory where, where we will be called possibly territorial lieutenant governors or some other term that doesn't confuse us with uh, commissioners. In fact, I've gone to banquets or events and there's been tables or chairs set aside for us and, and I've had a debate with the RCMP commissioner which commissioner was supposed to sit where. <laughs> because the chair both said commissioner. And then when I read the program at one of the events I was at, it said commissioner's opening remarks. And I went, nobody told me I was making any opening remarks. Well, it wasn't me, it was some other commissioner making the opening. So it, it becomes confusing and, and so that's something that we were working on. Um, uh, the other thing for myself is I wanted to establish eventually a permanent office for the commissioner. Um, the commissioner had rented space in the Albertini building many, many years ago. Uh, first, we, we were in the government building as uh, in Jim Smith days as the chief administrative officer. Well, once that happened, they moved out of that building and they moved into rental office space. And then we moved into the corner of Closely Manor, a senior citizens complex, and we were kind of given notice that we had to move out of there. And, and uh, I made it kind of a, a mission to try and find a permanent home for the office of the commissioner so that the, commis the future commissioners will never have to look around again for an office space. And, and, and thankfully, with uh, cooperation from the current government, we, uh, we acquired the, the Taylor House and we moved in there in the middle of February, the end of February this year. And uh, it's been quite exciting. It's, I'm, I'm pretty excited about the opportunities that that will afford us in the future. Now, speaking to you before the show, you made the point to me that it was about much more than just the administrative convenience of not having to move facilities when leases were up, but that it was important because of the office of the commissioner. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Well, the, the, you know, the, the people don't understand what the commissioner does, and that's probably the second biggest problem, not only our name, but, but just understanding what a commissioner does. Uh, some people, and even government people in government, think that all we do is sign land files or sign a document, take it over to the commissioner's office, get him or her to sign it, you know? And, and don't really understand the significance of the commissioner signing the document. And I suppose if we quit signing documents for a couple of weeks, people would, would understand clear what our role is, but I mean, that's not gonna happen. But, but you kind of, you, you know, we've worked hard in the last few years to try and raise the profile. Geraldine worked very good at that and, and worked hard at that, created the book on the, the role of commissioners and the history of the commissioners over time. And, uh, and so it, it's, it's gonna be an ongoing process to educate uh, Yukoners into the various levels and structures we have in the government. And I think it's important to do that. You know, I mean, uh, this is all about the values we have today, the freedoms, our democratic process. And I think it's, it's the system we have and, and I think it's important, more important that Canadians understand it. It's interesting, a lot of school kids understand more what the role of the commissioner is uh, when you talk to them. And if you, if you explain it to them, they remember it in school. Uh, I have more trouble with adults <laughs> explaining it than I do with the children. I was going to ask you about that. You're a regular visitor of schools around the Yukon. And, and do you think the Yukon needs to do more about uh, what in the old days they used to call it civics education or, or teaching, teaching the next generation about our system of government? 
Well, and, and you know what, it, 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 uh, we have quite an interesting history of government in the territory, you know, from the, the previous commissioners we had. I mean, uh, I mentioned the name of the commissioner, uh, I think it's changed a dozen times since 1900. You know, comptroller, controller, uh, uh, we were at one time way back when called lieutenant governors. Yeah. And the gold uh, commissioner for a while. The gold commissioner, I mean, it, it just changed over time. And, uh, and so that's just one issue. But then just what happened, uh, you know, through the EP letter, and through other, we, we slow, even before the epiletter, we're moving s more slowly towards uh, self-government in the territory. And now our territory runs now, uh, although people say, I don't want to be a province, you know, we don't want to be a province. Um, uh, quite frankly, we are about 95% of province the way we operate now. We make all our own decisions, you know, from education to tourism to highways to maintenance, all the things we do. We have ministers and, and people in the government who make those decisions locally, and very little of our decisions comes from Ottawa. What comes from Ottawa, of course, is a, is a significant amount of money which helps us pay for all these things. Now, one of the most important but seldom used powers of the commissioner relates to what to do after an election, especially if it's a close election. And uh, the Yukon has an election coming up in another year or two. Um, tell us a little bit about what happens and how you're going to get prepared in case you know, say it's, you know, each party gets six seats or it's, you know, 10, 10, 5, 4 or something like that. What, what do you do in those situations? Well, I'm kind of hoping like they did recently in England that it, it's, it's not a hung parliament, that, uh, that we do have a, a clear majority. But if we don't, uh, one of the things that we talk about in our annual conference of lieutenant governors and governor generals, and we'll talk about in Whitehorse, is what do you do when that happens? And, and the governor general's office has afforded all of us the luxury of of using his expertise, uh, of, of the experts he crawls on to deal with these kinds of issues. So we we uh, talk about that quite a bit about what will we do if, and and uh, and we've been told that they will they will come to our aid. I'm not a constitutional expert, so it would be very difficult for me, and I wouldn't. I, I, although I have to make that final decision, I'm kind of I would be very nervous about making it without some really strong uh, precedent backup. And, and I think that's how the Prime Minister, uh, whoever the Prime Minister will be, has to act, as well as uh, any, any Premier of any province would have to act. They would, they, we would, when they come to you and say, we want you to make a decision, then we would, we would call on the precedent and the background and the experts to help us, guide us through that decision. And that's what I hope I would do. I'm, I'm thinking that uh, Commissioner may be an even more nervous person on election night than some of the candidates. Yeah, I would think so. <laughs> I, and, uh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm the old Yukon type guy, so I'd probably do it with a coin flip, but I know you couldn't do that, you know. Uh, but uh, no, it's a, it, it, it's a pretty serious issue because, uh, you know, you can have a, a sitting government who, who has, uh, doesn't have a majority, and the other two parties have more seats, but the, the sitting government has the most seats, and uh, then you have to, you know, you have to urge them to form the government. Part of the role of the commissioner is to ensure that we have a government at all times. So it would be a role to uh, fairly quickly to make sure there is a government in power in the territory. Uh, and then uh, your role, tell us a little bit about your role in the, the speech from the throne, uh, which I think is also an area where a lot of people don't understand because it's, it's the commissioner giving the speech, but of course it's, not, it's, it's the message coming from the elected government. Yeah, and that, that can be confusing to the average person is that is that the speech is, is made by the government in power and they prepare it all. In fact, it says many times in the speech, my government will. And then we are right, basically the deliverer of the speech. We don't write the speech. Uh, we, we get the speech shortly before it's given just so that you can review it and make sure that you can, you can say all the words properly and, uh, and know how long it's going to be and that kind of thing. But, Generally, the speech from the throne, well, always the speech from the throne is, is the government's position and what they're going to do over the next uh, certain amount of years, and all you are is the messenger. You're, you're not the person who, who had anything to do with the speech other than to read it. In, and that's the ceremonial part or the constitutional monarch part of the speech. They do that in, in uh, London, England with the Queen. They do it in, in Ottawa with the Governor General. Yeah, the lieutenant governors in the provinces and the commissioners in the territory. Now, as you were saying, the, the role of the commissioner in many ways is like that of a lieutenant governor, but there, there are a few differences. Do you end up on the phone with uh, your colleagues in the Northwest Territories in Nunavut uh, talking about uh, um, various issues 
uh, questions around being a commissioner? Yeah, I do. And in fact, uh, what I did is, uh, I think two or three weeks after I was the commissioner, I contacted uh, the other two commissioners, and uh, George Tuckeroo and Edna Elias, Commissioner Elias and Commissioner Tuckeroo, and said, uh, let's form a, an accord. Let's, so that if there's issues that come up in the north, we talk about them. And so we do that, and we meet, uh, we meet once a year. We talk three or four more times a year on various issues. But uh, for instance, for the, respecting the name of the commissioner, uh, I took the lead in, in presenting the options to the lieutenant governors and the governor general and the prime minister, and uh, with advice from the other two commissioners. And we, we work on those kind of projects, royal tours, other things that happen. We, we kind of work together as much as we can on those kind of things. So. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great working relationship. In fact, I think yesterday was uh, Commissioner Elias's last day. And, uh, and I called her uh, a couple of days ago before the weekend, and she was on a, a cancer walk. And of course, couldn't take my call, but I'm hoping to talk to her this week when she gets back. She's uh, doing a fundraising for cancer. And then uh, and I talked to Commissioner Tuckeroo, and he's all excited about coming over. Uh, there'll be a new commissioner from, the North, or from Nunavut, uh, on the on our conference in, Ju in July and I'm hoping to strike the accord again with the new commissioners and carry on the tradition it's important a lot of our issues uh, again it's something we face to the north all the time is people don't understand uh, that there are differences in the north and that uh, you know the whole north isn't just uh, uh, yellow knife you know? now you've established a good working relationship with the governor general and uh, he's coming here with all the lieutenant governors in July. What do you have planned for the program to sh show well, them the Yukon? It's an exciting program. We're, uh, it's going to be a real Yukon program. Uh, first of all, I think the first day they arrive here, we're going to uh, open the Taylor House. The Governor General has agreed to do that. And this is the first uh, government house he's ever had to open. And because uh, most others are open across the country and have been for many, many years. So uh, I'm, I'm honored to have the Governor General here to open that. And then, uh, and then we proceed over to the SS Klondike. And uh, at the SS Klondike, where I have uh, 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 Grant Simpson in the boiler room of the SS Klondike playing the honky-tonk piano and the can-can girls uh, serving hors d'oeuvres and refreshments. And then we'll do a photograph in front of the SS Klondike. And then we have our annual black tie dinner for the Governor General, Lieutenant Governors, and we're going to do that at the Wheelhouse in Whitehorse. The next day, the meetings are all with the High Country Inn. And we'll meet there all day. And then the next night is the fun night and we're in the Kwanlun Don Cultural Center, and we're going to have the Dako Don dancers. Uh, some of my youth performers, Boyd Benjamin, a young fiddler. Uh, I'm going to have one of the other young ladies sing O Canada. And, uh, and then we have a couple of other, uh, we have a, a young violinist going to play. Some of my youth showcase uh, kids are going to perform for the Governor General and Lieutenant Governors, and I'm quite excited about that. that. And so are they. They're just tickled that they're getting an opportunity to perform for the Governor General. Well, that is a great opportunity. That's a great thing that you're doing to put uh, those young people on the map. That'll be a memorable experience for them and a lot of fun for everyone else. And I think, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier, people are trying to understand what the commissioner's office is. That, that uh, tour and that event should really put it on the map. Well, I hope so. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And, and I'm looking forward to the opening of the office. And, uh, and we're going we're gonna to focus in, uh, on the opening of the office on the Taylor House and the heritage and the history of the Taylor House. And I'm all excited about that and the events that I'm going to hold there in the future. It's going to be an exciting next couple of summers. I'm here for a couple more years. And uh, I'm looking forward to holding events in the yard throughout the summer and doing some special things at the Taylor House to, to focus on its heritage and the new office of the commissioner. I think it'll be pretty exciting. Well, Commissioner Phillips, thank you very much for joining us today. And good luck with the opening of Taylor House and the Governor General's visit. Well, thank you very much, Keith. Thank you.